Coming up on this week in Radio Tech, a little bit different tech. We're talking to Bill Sufa. Now, Bill's done the engineering thing and the engineering consulting thing, but he's also helping people in startup businesses and giving real engineers who may not have business advice or business experience, he's giving them great advice. It's all coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, this microphone or your microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack uh, here on episode 452, where we're talking with uh, uh, Bill Suf is going to be our guest. We'll bring him in in just a minute. Uh, I'm in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, my uh, my adopted hometown now. I've lived here almost 20 years, so I guess it's a hometown. And um, uh, this is where we do the show from whenever I'm up here in Nashville. So I appreciate the Telos Alliance for making uh, both the time and some equipment here uh, uh, available to me to uh, get, get this show done and to bring you broadcast engineers and uh, people who, who love the industry uh, information about uh, radio engineering, broadcast engineering. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And let me uh, s- uh, see if Chris Tobin is here from some undisclosed studio in uh, New Jersey. Hey, Chris, welcome in. <laughs> Hello, Kirk. Yes, I'm in my usual uh, voice booth uh, location in, uh, here in New Jersey. So it's good. Everything is yeah. good. Everything's going well. It's been a busy week, but it's been fun. Chris, I, you know, I don't mean to embarrass you in the least, but I have got to, we have got to get some uh, twerk uh, apparel. Because that thing just moir and does the moir effect so I bad. Totally <laughs> spaced out this morning, putting on the shirt and then <laughs> on the on the on the commuter ride in. I was like, oh, I just realized what I did wrong today. And the, well, I'm I'm thinking that's your torch shirt. Yeah, go. Maybe that helps. <laughs> Wait, what and, and because because the moir is, is so uh, pronounced, I can't tell what pattern it actually is. But you're you're a pinstripe kind of guy, aren't you? It's a pinstripe, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to polarizing filter for the the, the webcam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I don't know if that, that might help. Oh man. Well, yeah. We should. I, I, listen, you can blame me. I will. I will make sure somehow, some way, we get some tort apparel, and you can just keep a shirt at the radio station. Fair enough. And I can yeah. travel with it. Now, watch me send him some coveralls. <laughs> or some overalls. I got a pair of coveralls I work with during the winter months when I'm outside on. On building rooftops, so I can do yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. All right, uh, well, Chris is here, and we're talking about a, a topic. Uh, Chris and I didn't get to talk much about the show uh, today either, and, and it's always a surprise for Chris. Who's going to be the guest? He usually finds out about an hour beforehand who the guest is going to be. Fun. But, Chris, this is right up your alley because so often you're talking, uh, y- you lend to the conversation, uh, uh, intelligence, information, thoughts, and comments, about uh, good business governance uh, in in broadcasting, and also about how engineers can uh, improve perhaps their financial lot, how they can uh, um, uh, you know th- think about their customer, who their customer is, and how they can uh, uh, act properly toward that. And so, a, f- a couple of months ago, I you know I've I've known this name for quite some time because we have a lot of mutual friends, but I've never gotten to work directly with our guest Bill Sufa. And so let's let's bring him on in and uh, see what he looks like, and <laughs> we'll, we'll introduce him just a little bit more. Bill, welcome into the show. <laughs> Thanks, Kirk. <laughs> And of course, so, uh, Chris, Yankees fan. I mean, you know, gosh, what can I say? Pinstripes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Be a well, tough well, season. Turns out, uh, <laughs> Turns out Bill and I know a lot of the same people, and Bill has been in broadcasting and broadcast engineering consulting for a long time. But, Bill, you do other things as well. And I, what turned me on to you, Bill, was some comments you made on, on some Facebook posts, and I thought, this guy gets it. Man, I, I, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure who he is. I've heard his name, but he's making the most salient, intelligent, sensible comments on some posts that I don't, I don't know if they're controversial or not, but uh, you just made a lot of sense, Bill. So tell me, why did I get that impression from you? Because you missed the snark? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, so look, my, my, my background right now, I'm doing some independent consulting, mostly in business, um, working with companies that want to improve their lot, working on strategy, working a lot with startup companies. Um, prior to this, I had a startup company. I worked for Raytheon on, um, you know, monetizing, what do we call it? Monetizing intellectual property and, and working on M&A stuff. Um, basically, that means trying to make some money from the patents on the patent side and um, doing, doing M&A deals um, and getting to know the technology that we had a whole lot. Um, another startup before that in the, yeah, we'll call it global risk management space, and um, ran capital, the capital budgets for Clear Channel globally. Um, got to know a lot of the guys there really well in both the well, in all the divisions, radio, TV, at the time, radio, TV, outdoor entertainment, and um, spent some time in the consulting business, uh, working for Jules Cohen, and then later um, started a firm with Carl Lahm and Gary Cavell, and, um, you know, of course, as these things go, a professional services firm went through some machinations. Um, Richard... Um, uh, Richard Mertz joined us later. Um, oh yeah, sure. Soul. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, and, and of course, you know, got to know the people in that business pretty well and started, really started my career out, um, working as a field guy for the federal communications commission field engineer in New York. Um, ah, and mm -hmm. you know, if that, if that, if that doesn't teach you about, um, dealing with people, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a part of your career I didn't know about, but I'm, I want to know more. But tell you what, we're going to take our first break and be back. Uh, Bill Sufa is our guest. Chris Tobin's along. I'm Kirk Harnack. I want to ask a little bit about that field engineering. I don't know if the statute of limitations run out yet, if he can talk about uh, anything uh, in his adventures there. And then we're, uh, I just, well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll save this for after the break because we I've got some uh, cool application for what uh, I think uh, I think Bill can uh, can help with. Uh, this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store, and uh, this week our uh, equipment sponsor on our on BGS is uh, from the Henry Sportscaster. Sportscaster is the sports broadcast audio control system. It's an audio control system that is for managing the audio portion of a sporting event, radio, or video broadcast. Now, when used with the Henry Engineering Sports Pods, and those are cool uh, just on their own, uh, Sportscaster creates an integrated system that includes all the essential audio functions, including audio mixing, uh, of course, that's, you know, first thing that it does for the for on the air or for a webcast or for a video cast it also has headphone audio management and it's important that people hear the right things and distribution and off-air intercommunication that is intercom between the different people who are participating in the sports broadcast including a producer you know if, if you bring somebody like suncast along our producer to your sporting event uh then the then the producer can participate right along with everybody else in the headphone mix now, Sportscaster is a one-box solution that's comprehensive yet intuitive and easy to use. Now, by integrating all the functions into one device, uh, the Sportscaster eliminates the need for multiple mixers, distribution systems, headphone amps, intercoms, power supplies, and all that complicated wiring to connect them together. It's all in the same box. Sportscaster provides all these essential functions in a compact one RU package. Uh, a few of those functions that we normally don't cover, the camera operators have their own headphones output. So yeah, you got video along with your show, no problem. The camera operators hear what the producer's saying, and they can also hear the, the program material itself, so they know where, where to point that camera. Uh, it has a field reporter headphone output. It has a headphone mix for the field reporter and the camera operators. Party line intercom between the producer, the talent, and the field reporter and talk back from the producer to the camera operators. Plus, it has inputs for a crowd mic or a PA announcer. Sometimes you want to bring that PA announcer in to hear the, you know, the official side of the story. Well, you can do that, too. It even has a cue bus to audition auxiliary sources and a main program output, of course, that goes to your on-air, uh, you know, whatever kind of uh, codec or whatever your system is for getting things, uh, the audio back to your radio station or for streaming. Maybe you can even bring the stream encoder right there on site with you. So uh, this is a very cool box. Uh, the Sportscaster from Henry Engineering, along with the Sports Pods, uh, really do create a, an effective system. Uh, hey, it's it's uh, it's not too early. It's not too late. Pick one of these up. Add it to your sports production package, and you're going to find the level of your sports production goes way up 
when everybody can hear everybody else and it just works out really well. Now, where can you order one of these? Well, you, of course, you can order from uh, our friends at Broadcasters General Store. We appreciate BGS for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. You get, got the phone number memorized? I do. I think I memorized it 25 years ago. 352-622-7700. And their website is bgs.cc. bgs.cc. But I, I recommend you call them. Everybody there has a phone. They got a, they got the whole ordering system right in front of them. And honestly, BGS has worked up probably the industry's best system for keeping you, the customer, in touch with where your order is, how long it's going to take to get there, where it is in transit, how soon do you want it, how soon is it available. So give them a call. Broadcasters General Store. Thanks a lot to BGS and Henry Engineering and the Sportscaster for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right. Our, our guest is Bill Sufa. Uh, Chris Tobin's along. So, so Bill, um, uh, l- let's let's chat a, a bit more about your broadcast engineering uh, pedigree. You worked with some big names in the industry. Uh, what what kind of engineering were you doing, or were you just there? Were you there primarily on the business consulting side to help these engineering firms, uh, uh, you know, make a make a profit, move along? No, it was uh, you know I I did engineering for a long time and um um. Did, did a lot of AM directional arrays, and back then I don't have a beard, but it would be great if I did. Um, worked on a number <laughs> of AM arrays, worked on some FM, some um, you know docket eighty ninety stuff. Um, spent spent a fair amount of time working on some some stuff for the industry, which mm-hmm. would include the the FAA electromagnetic compatibility that basically interference to airplane radios from FM radio. Um, um, spent some time um, in Geneva uh, with the, at the ITU working on international standards for that. And, um, um, you know, so, so, you know, worked with a lot of, a lot of people got to know some, some really big names some really great names in the, in the industry and the, the transition to business, you know, I, I see the background was with the commission with Jules Cohen. Um, worked on mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of stuff. Jules, Jules, one of the the, the great names in the industry, um, and and joined Carl and and Gary, um, both really great engineers. Um, uh, eventually, you know, got my MBA and uh, was was doing some work for Randy Michaels um, at JCOR back then. Yeah. JCOR, yeah. Sure. Um, back when telecom, telecom 96 came in and Randy essentially made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I went to Cincinnati and, um, um, we were bought by clear channel, moved to clear channel, ran the, the global capital budget for them. So I'll bet you, you know, it's been, I'll bet you, I, uh, I just, I, I probably just missed you on a visit to Randy myself at, J, at J core in the uh, mid nineties. Uh, I've went to visit him myself, uh, to sell him some automation systems back then. Wow. <laughs> so, Hey, you, you mentioned, um, uh, the FAA and, uh, FM station interference to aircraft. And this has yep. always been uh, a bit of a mystery to a lot of engineers. Now, I'm I am a private pilot. It's been a few years, uh, but as you know, the license doesn't expire, so it's your currency that does. Uh, and you know, I couldn't help but notice that a lot of the planes that I rented, with their just uh, horrible uh, aviation communications radios that were AM, man, they sure picked up a lot of FM and TV audio in those radios when I was anywhere near a tower. Uh, what 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 can you tell us about your work there, and and why why is the FAA? Well, I know why, why they're concerned, but why does the FAA? Why is the technology such that the FAA has to be so concerned about FM interference to aviation radios? Well, you know, some, and, and and admittedly, Kirk, I, I, I too am a pilot. Um, I've got my commercial ticket. Um, sold plan a couple of years ago, uh, but still, you know. Mm, I, I need to get currency back, but that's a different story. Um, so look at, look at the frequency allocation. So you you got the FM band that runs up to 108, and then right above 108 starts the navigation radio band. Mm, um, that's and right. Then, and then comm communications is above that. Um, so, and, and it's particularly an issue in, in major metro areas where there are limited frequencies. So the ILS systems, of course, operate right above the... FM band, um, the, the, the localizer in particular, the, the glide slopes 
higher in frequency, generally not a problem. Um, and then in some cases, VOR. And what, what happens is, um, as we all know, because as engineers, we have undoubtedly dealt with it, intermod and blanking or, you know, over, overpowering overload of the front end of a receiver. Um, if you fly into Dallas and you fly by Cedar Hill, if you fly into parts of Houston and you go by the FM towers down there, if you go into New York City where everything's on top of everything else, um, what can happen is you can you can get blanking, you can get intermod either in the receiver or or in those rare cases coming out of the transfer. It's generally not coming out of the transfer. It's generally a receiver yeah. issue. Um, and you talked about the older radios. When I was doing working on that stuff, which would be pre-96, um, what we found was even some of the more expensive receivers, even some of the stuff in airliners um, had an issue because, well, you know they they didn't they, they didn't make front ends really to reject the 100 kilowatt fm station 200 kilohertz below the the ils so um you know it 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 gets to be a problem if you're flying by the tower and the fa was was absolutely adamant in fact you know um, our tca radio uh, technical commission for aeronautics um, equally had a problem of putting filters in the lines because generally it's one antenna connector and, you know, if it's, <laughs> you might take something else out. So it, it, it became an issue. It led to the FAA developing some airspace analysis programs. Um, it led, led to some international stairs. Now, admittedly, with the growth of GPS, the growth of um, the, the growth, growth of precision GPS, differential GPS, mm -hmm. um, this is less of an issue because all those are different frequencies. But as I found out with the, uh, I'll call it fairly current, um, Garmin system in my plane, um, there were some, sometimes when you would transmit on certain frequencies, it would wipe out the GPS because of internal spurs so that was that was the issue of the faa um it was a safety issue yeah sometimes it was fm stations and sometimes it was you know, back back in the day you know my day with the fcc well, top priority was safety of life services um i remember flying in a <laughs> huey over long island with the doors open um trying to track where a signal was coming from and in the end we tracked it down to um an FM converter in a car that was self oscillating. Oh, um, we we tracked down TV amplifiers that were going to self oscillation when cable came in, and all they did was to snip off the <laughs> snip off the wires on the back of the TV, three hundred yeah. coax re radiating back into the antenna. You know, anyway. So that was that was the big concern, and it's it's still a concern. It's less so with the GPS approaches, but it's still a concern. That brings up well, wow. One final question on on the aviation related stuff. Um, with the huge popularity of GPS and precision approaches, will there come a time when uh, the FAA is is not very concerned, or becomes completely unconcerned, or eventually decommissions? Uh, the ILS approaches that use frequencies, you know, 108, 109, 110, 111 uh, megahertz, just above the FM band. W will that ever go away? No, I no? don't think so. Um, okay. A, it's, it's an international standard. Um, oh, yeah. Some of them may go away. If, if they can't flight check them, if you can't certify them, some of the smaller airports or relievers, it might go away. But, but just like you're doing with the VOR system, where they're decommissioning a number of VORs, um, they're still living it back. And the, the reason for that is that GPS is fragile. Um, it yeah. is not, not to either wipe out or to jam or to actually spoof a GPS signal. Um, and that's, yeah, that's really the problem. And I, and not to give anybody ideas, but, you know, one could pretty easily wipe out uh, an ILS too, you know, to, uh, so... I, it, 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 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, although, All right. although it's harder yeah. than into the band. Although it's harder ah. to do with iOS. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, uh, Chris Tobin, before we we move on, you got to, uh, uh, maybe you'd like to hear, hear some more stories from uh, from Bill about his uh, days in, in New York with the uh, the FCC. What do you think, Chris? No, that's quite all right. I, I've got my experiences with the, the FCC New York uh, office at Barracks Foods. So. <laughs> They're good guys. A lot of them have retired. Uh, we had some we had some good times with them. And uh, uh, the hardest part, was, as Bill pointed out, was the technologies. <laughs> <laughs> what was was that when Henry Paulson was still there, or was that after Zimney came in? That was after uh, Zimney came in. Yeah, I was, work, I was working with. Him. Yeah, Damn I was. Well. I I worked with. I worked with with uh, with Alex and um, J- John and um, and Dan. John, and yes, John. That's who I- <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, if you got a visit from Judd, you. Uh, Better make sure your eyes are dotted and T's across, and do not try to uh, <laughs> play any games. He was fun, but 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 it, yeah, he he was. But if you got him to the side, he really was a good guy. He really. Oh was. no, he was great. No, he he was one of the guys in one of our SPE meetings early, early on, like in the I guess the eighties, and uh, at a meeting with everybody in the New York market. As we all know, modulation wars were a big thing. They still are to some degree, and um, he was very very um, candid and said, "Look, I understand it's a business. I understand you have to make money, and I understand that." Uh, if you don't allow us on the dial, you make more money, or maybe not. But uh, let's let's see how we do this. If any one of you decide to call me and turn in somebody else, I'm coming after all of you. Okay, <laughs> let's. Go. That was pretty much how it worked. And there was, in New York City, for the longest time, there was always a gentleman's agreement when it came to uh, modulation concerns. And anybody at the uh, at the transmitter building, uh, the big building, and you know, on overnights, would come down the hall and say, "Hey, uh, Bob, uh, looking at your modulation. Are you okay?" Yeah, we had a little bit of a problem with the uh, CP803, but we're good now. Okay, well, it's good to see you. See you later. It was like the Hanna Barbera cartoon, cartoon with the uh, what do you call it? The coyote and the rooster. And hello, Sam. How's it going? Time clock. Boom. See you tomorrow. And they go chasing after the sheep again. <laughs> That's right. <there. laughs> yeah. It's uh, so so so. You remember the first generation of um, composite clippers? Uh, the, the the early stuff. That would yes. wipe out the pilot too. I, I still yes. remember walking into a very well known, very, very big name, at least at the time, um, FM station in New York. And um, um, the, the chief engineer you know, kind of looked at me and said, Well, you know, before you leave, I want to have a conversation about modulation. And I looked at him and said, Well, funny, that's why I'm here. And uh, he <laughs> says, You're not going to make me take that box out of the line are you i said i don't care what you do but you can't take the pilot out <laughs> when you're the peak <laughs> uh, bill one of the things that you you mentioned was this uh this phrase uh or these initials m and a and you said that that has yep. to do with uh helping a company to uh make profitable or make money from their intellectual property typically in the form of patents okay how, how do we do this um Tell me about that kind of work, and does any of that relate right into into broadcast, or is that is that really is there not much of that crossover into broadcast world? Well, actually, actually, there are two separate things. M and A is mergers and acquisitions. So, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, one one of the things I did with Randy, and one of the things I did with Clear Channel was to allocate money and and you know have some oversight over the acquisitions we did. Um, you know, I know there are a lot of people that, that despise the consolidation in the industry. Um, got it. There were some things that, that, you know, but, but at that point, you know, when the, when the, the, the limits came off, it was eat or get eaten. And, um, you know, we, we, we bought a lot of stations, um, you know, and, and continued to, I, I like working on that stuff, but, but, you know, there, there are a lot of guys that I call them deal guys, right? They're, they're, they're the guys here, the Wall Street guys that just like to come in and they, you know, like real, well, not real estate brokers, but investors, you know, they just like to come in and get the deal done and move on to the next deal. Um, for, for me, it's all about the strategy from one end to the other. You know, okay, we're going to buy this. We cut the deal. How are we going to make it work at the end? How are we going to integrate that stuff? And, um, you know, Randy had some great ideas. It wasn't, it wasn't what radio became. Um, 
a lot of that happened afterwards. So we, we all know the financial pressures of the industry. We know the, the two big guys have been been through bankruptcy. Um, we we know kind of what's been driving a lot of that stuff. But that, yeah, with 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 Randy, a lot of it was all about quality. And, uh, you know, it, much as I love the the hokiness, if you will, of a small market station that's still, still doing farm reports, um, the fact of the matter is that some of them, you know, if they were running an old SMC automation system, they really didn't sound very good. And yeah, what the yeah. voice tracking did, what the automation, the network automation system voice tracking did was, was allow us to import talent and make them sound an awful lot better. Now that's not for everybody, but you know, for, for the right select group, it was, um, of course that got turned into, oh, we can cut staff and you know, we see where it ended up. That's it's, it's the unintended consequences. So yeah, it is what it is. So uh, it, before we take our next break, I wonder if you could uh, help us understand uh, a bit more, though, about intellectual property. And um, uh, you don't have, obviously don't name any, any names of, of your, your current clients or people who you, who you have helped. But uh, how, how does a company, let's say you, uh, one company buys another, along with the purchase comes some intellectual property. Um, hey, maybe that comes mm-hmm. in the form of people. And I, the company I work for, Telos, we have bought a number of other different companies, and uh, and largely we have done that. I say we, you know, the people who I work for, Telos, have done that because, man, some very good intellectual property came along, but also some really clever uh, people came along with that too, and 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 those people are are largely still uh, still with us and creating more good ideas. Talk to me about that kind of business and how you help shepherd that along. Yeah, there, there, there. Two, as you say, there are two pieces of it. One is, you know, what's up here. Intellectual property, as it's generally defined, is patents. It's trade secrets. Um, it it might be copyrighted stuff. Um, there's a huge business out there um, in uh, publishing rights, music publishing rights. Right? We were talking about music a minute ago. Um, Music publishing rights, that's intellectual property. You know, it's, it's something tangible. It's got, it's an asset. And um, what, what, you know, that, that has a value to it. And it comes with, you know, radio stations. So it might be the logo. It might be the format. It might be, you know, in, in the case of my, you know, big defense company employer, um, this whole, you know, trove of patents um and and those have value in part to um you know some of them are defensive some of them are to protect the thing some of them are gain monetization down the road um you know we saw the the apple samsung patent battles and qualcomm's involved and all this kind of stuff and 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 the big company the biggest companies the IBM's, uh, the Raytheon's, the Lockheed Martin's, uh, um, AT&T, Apple, you, know, you name it. They get as many patents as they can and as much as defensive. So if somebody infringes on, so, so if, if they're infringing on somebody else's patent, they try to come out and say, well, you're infringing on our patent and, and some kind of deal is cut. So that's generally what intellectual property means. Um, you know, from the radio business side, most of its formats, it's um, it's logos, it's content, it might be internally produced programming, original programming. Um, th- there's a whole bunch of stuff that falls into that copyright intellectual property thing. Um, and and you know, from from your business, from from Telos, they're they're going to have a lot of patents. They're going to have trade secrets, which basically, which are often better than patents because you don't have to disclose anything about it. Um, oh, yeah. And, and in the, the case of the, one of the more recent groups, startup companies I've been working with, the one I went through the NSFI Corp program with, um, they've, they've got a patent, but They've also got some trade secrets, the know-how of how to make that patent actually work. So mm. I know the patent's requirement is reduced to practice. Okay, fine. 
you can reduce it to practice, but sometimes it takes a little know-how to actually make it work. And that's the secret sauce. And that's that's a trade secret. Um, the the Coca-Cola. Oh, looks like we lost a, lost a good connection with uh, Bill for the moment. Tell you what, we're going to go ahead and take a break and uh, come back and let Bill finish that thought uh, after these uh, after this message. Hey, our show, This Week in Radio Tech, it's episode 452. Bill Sufa is with us. Uh, he formerly did a lot of engineering, just like a lot of us do, uh, and uh, handled a lot of FCC applications and, and higher-level work like that, and FCC uh, uh, working out of an FCC office himself, but now does a lot of biz- business consulting. So we'll be talking to Bill more about that in a few minutes. I've got some questions. I'm sure Chris does, too. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at CalRec. We'll be right back. Type R is CalRec's first native IP-based mixing console. It is fully AES67 and NMOS ISO4 and ISO5 compatible as defined by SMPTE 2110. Connectivity via CAT5e utilizing COT switches and power to the surface is supplied via standard PoE switches to minimize cabling. Its 2U core has integrated I.O., so you're instantly up and running, and it can power up to three independent mixing environments, each with their own separate DSP resources. Type R's surface is modular and expandable, consisting of three slimline panels, each of which are user-definable with layouts saved and recalled quickly between shows. It's available in four DSP packs, and as your station grows, larger packs can be added, making Type R the most flexible radio console you can buy. Find out more at calrac.com slash twerk. And thanks a lot to CalRec for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Go to calrec.com slash twerk. Hey, studio guests are only human, and humans, well, they cough, and they sniff, <laughs> and they clear their throats, mm-hmm, even on the air. You can cure this with the Angry Audio Guest Gizmo. You press the cough button and you mute the mic. Every guest needs one. You know what else they need? Headphones. Which is why each Guest Gizmo has a studio-quality headphone amp with individual volume control. Anything else? You've seen those mic arms that have the built-in LED tallies? They're beautiful. But how do you get them to light up? Well, the Guest Gizmo does that, too. It illuminates the red light whenever the mic is hot. And installing the Guest Gizmo in your studio furniture couldn't be easier. You just need a two and three quarter inch hole saw and a steady hand. No router required. Your studio gets a clean custom appearance and you get all the credit. Check out the Guest Gizmo and all the cool gadgets at angryaudio.com. That's angryaudio.com. Thanks a lot to both CalRec and Angry Audio for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, we're back. It's episode 452 of This Week in Radio Tech. Kirk Harnack in the TELUS Alliance studio. And uh, Chris Tobin is with us at some undisclosed <laughs> announced booth in New Jersey. And Bill Suf is with us. Bill, I didn't ask, where, where are you uh, coming to us from? Uh, you know, I'm coming to you from my dining room today, believe it or not. Um, I, I, just didn't, I just didn't feel like turning the studio on downstairs. So. <laughs> Well, you're you're fine. You, you're an East Coast guy, though, right? You're on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you you laugh. I would have hooked up the the Automax and Volumax for this. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> it, wow. So, do you actually have an Automax and a Volumax? I do. I got three oh, Volumaxes. Wow. One one Automax uh, BL forty and. Um, Oh gosh, some other stuff. I got some Apex stuff down there too. So I take it. Uh, uh, what what is some of your favorite vintage broadcast gear? Like, what don't you have that you'd like to have? Uh, well, it's more like what would I what would I like to have, but don't want to pay the electric bill for. Okay. Um, you know, a GE BT twenty five A is pretty cool. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> The old fifty kilowatt monster, mm-hmm. um, um, you know that's that's probably the top of the list. You know, it's probably probably some of the old gates gates enter type um, stuff that that would be interesting. Um, but you know, I yeah, I, I, I don't want to pay for it, but a DAP would be nice too. Oh yeah, yeah, a, a DAP three ten. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
do you have any do you have any secrets for negotiating with other family members so that you can have this stuff? Because you know, my wife, I nothing, I can't have anything upstairs in the house. Well, you know, a lot of a lot of this I got for little or no money. So uh, <laughs> every once in a while, I get a you know kind of a stink eye when I say, "Well, I need this for the ham radio," but um, <laughs> otherwise. No, you know, I, it's is generally shopping it. It's it's begging, it's borrowing, it's stealing. It's uh, you know, at 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 one at at one point, I had a lot of this before we even yeah, before we even took up with each other. So yeah, yeah you know, yeah. it is what it is. So uh, so let's talk about the entrepreneurial stuff. And and in our pre-show, you had mentioned a bit about the National Science Foundation and how they uh, have a program to uh, to help. Uh, engineers who have cool ideas that looks like there there may be a, a market for what they uh, what their ideas are. Talk to us a bit, a bit about that and your work uh, in association with that. Sure, there there are several you know there are several programs out there. NSF um, had a had a, a charter essentially a, a, were, were directed by Congress to 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 start a program to help uh, move some of the intellectual property, some of the inventions. That are done in the federal labs and in federally funded um, university settings, and, and God knows we all know how much money goes into university research. Um, how to how to move some of the inventions there out into the real world, and how to take engineers that you know were were, were engineers or scientists and make them into entrepreneurs. And you know it it really is a great program. Um, it's called ICOR. It's not open to everybody, although I get I think some of the the nodes have programs that are open. I know the the, the one here is through George Washington University. Um, they've got some programs to help a to help students, and they've they've also done some programs from time to time that that use the same material to work with people in the community. And the, the focus there, the, the first focus is um, customer customer discovery is what it's called. Um, the program is based around a lean startup methodology so it was developed by Steve Blank, Silicon Valley guy, um, a number of years ago. And, um, and, 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 you know, this is a really cool website. Um, Steve, steveblank.com. Um, Steve's got a lot of stuff on his site about the, the Lean Startup Program and entrepreneurship and, and that sort of thing. Um, but he's, if you dig around, he's also got some, some stories of kind of how he got into it and his adventures working for government contractors back um, a, a few decades ago. It's, it's, it's fascinating reading. And, and, and for somebody who's, um, who's ever worked in a this a government secret environment it's kind of amusing um and, and kind of leaves your mouth open but um yeah the, 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 we now understand with edward snowden some of the stuff happens anyway back to icor icor teaches you about customer discovery and and the whole premise of this thing is the reason most startups fail and there's research to back this up the reason most startups fail is that What's produced is what what you produce or what you take to market, what you try and sell is not what the customer needs. Doesn't mean the customer needs. So the, the whole concept here of the lean startup is let's let's find a business model that meets a customer need. So uh, you know if I'm working on a really cool particle separator, for example, uses laser light particle separation. Well, who's going to need that? What do they need it to do? Um, you know, a need might be in the pollution monitoring area, or it might be in the um, QC line of a drug company, or it might be looking for impurities in chemical processes. Um, so the, the whole program is um, scientific based. Put up a hypothesis, go out and test the hypothesis by talking to customers. What do they need? How do they buy? How much are they willing to pay? And the, the, the whole goal here is before you spend a lot of money spinning up a startup, starting a company, all that kind of thing, you're going to have to find out what the customer needs and not just what they want. You have to kind of sort through that. 
but what do they need? What What is their biggest problem? Um, great story that one of the instructors told. He was involved in a startup business um, a decade ago, and it was to monitor air conditioners in office buildings. And they spun up this whole software development thing and sensors and um, scatter or radio control monitoring and all the rest of this stuff. And they spent a lot of money doing that. And they found out that what they probably should have done was to go for the first X amount of time um, and actually have somebody go read the read the stuff. Go go actually physically look at the unit, and then report that back so they could work it out with the customer what the customer really wanted. So how does that apply to um, the the well, what we're talking about? The engineers, broadcast, all that kind of thing. Well, you know, for, first of all, a number I I know a number of people are contract people, contract engineers. You're running the business. You got a customer. You got to understand what they want, and you got to produce what they want. And 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 um, you know, it's not all about price. It's about staying on the air. It's about finding creative solutions. Um, if you're an employee, well, your employer is a customer. But more importantly than that, you've got to understand what the customer on the outside wants, um, because you know. Maybe the customer wants loudness. Maybe they don't want loudness. Uh, if you're working for a classical station, maybe they don't care about clipping the audio. Uh, maybe they want it to sound more pure. All these kinds of things come into play. Um, and you really got to understand what your customer wants and, and, the, and the value that you can deliver to somebody else. Why would they want to buy your services if you're doing the same thing as everybody else? Why are they going to choose you over somebody else? Good point. <laughs> that reminds me of a situation I was in as an employee of a company. And I used to treat in the engineering department the uh, departments I worked with, so you know, programming, marketing, and sales and everything, as customers to engineering, which I know at the time was very novel and still is a difficult pill to, to swallow for some of the executives. And uh, I worked with a program director and one of my fellow colleagues in the engineering department to come up with some solutions for him. And one day he came to me and said, look, I've got the opportunity. I've told this story, I think, before. I've got this opportunity to uh, to cover Justin Bieber at a bowling alley debuting his new album or his song. But here's what I need. And I said, what? Record label will give us this, this, and this if we can produce the following. I said, All right, that's an interesting thing. And you want to do it where? In the bowling alley. Mind you, this is in New York City. It's in Times Square. So it's not like a small venue. And I'm, I now have to come up with a remote broadcast for a radio station in New York City at a bowling alley with Justin Bieber at the height of his you know, his, his, his whole thing, his career. And I'm like, wow, how do we do this? So I'm talking with a buddy of mine. Where, where, I'm saying, well, who's who's benefiting? I said to the program director, I said, who benefits? What What's the goal here? You got to give me the bigger picture. I don't, Justin Bieber, I get. I need to know more because the audience doesn't care if they can't be there to play with them. So he explained, he goes, look, if we can do this, the record label will give us four more artists over the next six months in Times Square, Rockefeller Center, Battery Park, <laughs> Central Park. So I'm like, all right, I get it. And then I and I started thinking, and I said, you know, I work for a company that has, has a TV division. What if I go to the TV guys and say, can I borrow you a little portable microwave transmitter? And uh, so we did. I went over to the TV go folks and said, hey, you still got that little transmitter box? Yeah. Okay. I want to borrow it for a day to do this. But you had a radio group. I said, yeah. So he goes, radio? What do you need a video box for? I said, well, the video portion is going to go to our website. We're going to stream the event. The look in the room in the shop was like, what? But it's a radio station. Who wants to see video? I'm like, oh, I'm <laughs> you know what? There's no horizontal control in the car for the radio also. I get that. But I said, just work with me on this. Can I have access to the microwave channel in the on the network in the city for this one date, you know, from this time period? Because we had, I think we had like six different microwave channels. And it was used by all the ENG trucks in the company. So I had to make sure I got on the schedule. Otherwise I'd be screwed or I'd be taking somebody off of a live newscast. And um, 
So went back to the program director and said, what if I could offer you the following solution to your dilemma? I told him, we can do the audio, we can do the video, and we can do it everywhere in the city at a moment's notice. He looked at me and goes, hang on. Reaches over, I'm going to do the same thing right here, picks up the phone, calls the sales manager and says, if I can guarantee you four appearances with artists with the record label we had a meeting with yesterday, would you be able to sell it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, good. Hangs up the phone. All right, we're a go. We now have four dates. Let's start it. How do we make this work? I'm like, ooh, this is going to be fun. So <laughs> the, point of the, the point of this whole thing is to say we need to be thinking, just as, as you, Bill, Bill point out, the customer, the end user, whatever you want to call it. I mean, if you follow Seth Godin or, or, or any of these guys that talk about you know, um, marketing and managing and understanding the solutions, you got to look at the end user, which is either both combination of your department you work with and then you know the listener or viewer, depending on what you're doing. And back in the day, that we were doing streaming was very limited. The video was very limited, and nobody really understood where it goes with that. So I, I can't believe they actually went with it, but we did it. So we put this little lunchbox device in the window at the bowling alley. I ran a video cable and audio to our spot, shot the video. I went back to our, our TOC, put it up on our uh, network internally, uh, the, the microwave. We snapped, the, you know, grabbed the video and audio, put it to the website. And the FM audio <clears throat> went to the studio for standard remote as if we were using a Marty or an ISDN or whatever. And uh, we did it. And the funny thing was we got to move around because I also left out the fact that I borrowed a wireless camera. So when Justin decided he wasn't going to be out front when everybody's going screaming, he wanted to retreat to the uh, more safe and calmer area. The only people that could get back there was us, and we had the camera. <laughs> and our our afternoon, our, our jocks were interviewing Justin while the TV crews who were doing the news event with their sticks and the trucks out front and the, the ENG, the you know the antennas up on the mast and everything else had to stand by the red carpet and wait for them to come back out. So uh, needless to say, after that. We got a lot of calls in the engineering office about, we'd like to do something from a boat on the Hudson. What do you think? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, we, want to, we want to do something from a moving vehicle. You know, it's like, all right, I get it. I get it. But to Bill's point, these are things that made us money and made it work. And, you know, the ratings in return came. The listeners went up. Sale. I mean, you know, it, it, that's what you do. That's how you survive. Or and you can have non-traditional uh, businesses take over your, your market and you're, you're screwed. Exactly. The thing you did absolutely right out of that is, is that you asked the question, give me the bigger picture. What does this really mean? How does this, essentially, how does this make this money? How, what do you need? And, um, you know, going back to the sales manager, all that stuff, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. And, and that's the, the kind of thing we do in the startup. Or any, you take engineers, uh, and, and you know, look, I'm, my undergraduate degree was engineering. I get it. I've been one. Um, I, I still got the PE license. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, many engineers, and I've I've been dealt with a lot of them, don't like to talk to the customer. Don't like to talk to you know. It, it, there are any number that would like to sit in their their little hole. In fact, one that I worked with was was kind of like, well, I don't want to be CEO of the company. Um, I want to do my thing. Well. Yeah, but you're the guy that understands the technology. You got to go out and talk to a customer. This NSF program over a five week period makes people go out and do a hundred in person, face to face customer interviews, potential customer interviews. It's pretty intense. And sometimes the findings are jaw dropping. I've seen people just completely turn their business model, what they thought was their business model going in, turn it over completely. Uh, I've seen a couple of people give up and said, you know what, <laughs> this is a no go. This is, we can't find anybody who, who, who wants to use the, use, use the technology we've got, but you know what, it, it, in, in a sense, that means the program was success because this guy didn't go. And it was a guy, this guy did not go raise $10 million to start up a business, go spend it, go burn all that cash and find out that nobody's gonna gonna buy anything anyway. So, mm. you know, that's that that the whole goal is efficient use of capital. And um, you know, that was one of the things I did at Clear Channel, and it's one of the things I love doing now. It's, uh, it's time for us to actually to take our last break, and uh, when we come back, we're gonna look for a tip of the week, and and Bill. 
promised me he'd, he'd have something cool. So I think we've gotten some good wisdom here and, uh, and, and good thoughts. I, I actually had a couple more questions, but we're going to be out of time here pretty soon. So let's take our, our last break. And we'll be right back with uh, me and Chris and Bill Sufa with our tips of the week. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment, are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes. And enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. We really appreciate them and all of our sponsors on the show. They really do help make it possible for us to bring this to you uh, almost every week. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack, Chris Tobin's along, and Bill Sufa is with us as well. I'm going to uh, do run go first right here with a real quick tip of the week, and I hope I haven't mentioned this one before. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I've been kind of slow on the whole smart home thing, and I, I still don't have, you know, my she who shall not be named uh, <laughs> behind me over there tied into anything she's listening now um good more listeners for the show but uh, i have i recently had a need to remotely reboot something uh my wife and i own a cabin it's a rental cabin uh, in the mountains uh, uh in near gatlinburg and we have i have an electronic device there that um, is less reliable than i'd like and rebooting it brings it right back to service. So I wanted a solution for that. So I, I got a pack of four of these, and I know you've seen these everywhere, and plenty of you are way more up on these than I am. But this particular one uh, was offered from Amazon, and uh, it, the uh, the brand name on it is, uh, of all things, um, I think it's uh, Miros, M-E-R-O-S-S. -S. And so I've got I've got them set up for a, 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 on the on the app here. A, uh, I can turn on and off an office uh, floor lamp. Uh, oh, that's one right back here. So because I've got a window here that somebody could break into, I, I have this thing go on and off when I'm not here. Uh, so, uh, you know, on a, on a schedule, uh, on a kind of a randomized schedule. And then I've got uh, access to a remote security camera at the cabin that I can reboot if it misbehaves. It hasn't misbehaved in a long time, but it was at first, so I put that in. And I'm kind of looking for a couple more uses for uh, for these. Th these were cheap. Uh, they were $7 a piece in a pack of four. So uh, they were uh, under 30 bucks for four of them. So that was pretty cool. And I'm I'm liking it. I haven't got them tied into anything else. They, they, they These can tie into if this, then that. Um, and they can tie into your, your uh, you know, your home, uh, Google home thing or uh, she how, who shall not be named. That's just my tip. I'm playing with them. Maybe you have some uh, really cool ideas as to stuff you can use these for. And maybe someday we'll have them all connected. So there you go. Chris Tobin, you got a tip of the week for us? I, well, my tip this week will be uh, for those of us, uh, our colleagues and the viewers and listeners, next time you're uh, called, you have an opportunity to sit in a meeting that's not engineering at your radio or TV station, take a mm -hmm. back seat sit in the back of the room and just listen carefully to the conversations, the uh, ups and downs and what's, what's going on and,
begin learning how the other half works because at the end of the day, if you can't contribute to the revenue generation of the operation, you become an expense. And on that ledger sheet, you become a blank line. So uh, mm. try to become a contributor to the expense, uh, the expense of operation, the cost of doing business, rather than being the expense for the cost of doing business. So that's my, my tip yeah. is start learning beyond your, your, your walls. You already know the engineering. You can read the books. That's all great. But do you know anything about marketing and uh, the share of the market and what you're doing, total dominant area and all these other things? Um, begin learning that stuff. And uh, you'll be surprised how quickly you, s- you become a uh, more, more, more dollar signs can come your way if you do it right. You become a, a trusted asset in the company and not just an yes. expense. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I, I could be I mean, wrong. Bill, a, Bill knows better, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Bill, what, what no, do you got for no, us? You're, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, Chris, you're, you're right spot on. And it's not just sitting in on the, the music stuff and the promotions and the marketing, but sales. Um, you know, look. Uh, oh, yeah. Show, yeah, yeah, show yeah, interest. Yeah, go, go out on sales calls. Oh, I can't hear the radio station where I live. Um, well, that gives you a clue. Go check it out. Go figure out what's going on. Um, absolutely, get in, get involved in other stuff. Be, be around. Be seen. Don't go hide out at the transmitter site. Yeah, you got duties there, but a lot of this stuff is so reliable now. You don't need to spend a lot of time there. Um, my tip of the week on the entrepreneurship side is um, I mentioned it earlier. SteveBlank.com, um, Lean Startup. Um, Steve, Steve's got a, a, a website. Um, he's written some books. It's all about customer discovery. Um, really when you get down to it, lean startup is a six Sigma process. Um, they don't call it six Sigma. They're really smart. They don't want to turn people off, but ultimately that's, you know, kind of the, kind of the underlying basis. Um, uh, Steve and, 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 and actually for, for a little bit of amusement, go in there and, and look at the, I think he's got a link called secret history, uh, which talks about his ad- adventures in the, um, what do, what do we call it? The national security, so the, the black world. Um, it's, 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 it's very fascinating. It's very interesting. Um, but, but again, you know, the, 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 the premise is you want to be understand how business works all of how business works and you got to get out of your shell. Want to make sure I'm hearing that right. Steve blank.com, right? Steve. Yep. Steve, Steve, conventional spelling and mm-hmm. um, blank blank, the conventional spelling B L A N K. So gotcha. Steve blank.com. I found his, I, that's what I thought I heard. Found his website. Looks good. We'll put a, a link to that in the show notes so that uh, people can follow up on that. And uh, yeah, there he is. He's given the commencement address at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, So uh, yeah, a a, a sought after speaker, smart guy. A really smart guy. All right. Hey, we got to go. Oh, uh, Chris, you uh, had an announcement to put out uh, for everyone, uh, a little bit of bad news, but uh, news that needs to be told. What is that? Yes, I didn't. I didn't want to be a, a Debbie Downer, so to speak, but I, had, I just wanted to pass this along because I know there's a lot of folks who know him. Uh, last week, I got I received several phone calls and I just read about it. I think in Inside Radio, uh, Richie Herbie, the engineer here in New York City, passed away last week. Uh, Richie was in the market uh, 23 plus years. He was with CBS for 23 of those years, and then shortly after retiring from CBS, he moved on to contract work with the folks at Relevant Radio also here in the New York market. And uh, it's a sad moment because I worked with Richie at CBS and uh, he was one of the few guys who could actually sit in a room and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Tell me more so we can do something and make it work. And uh, he's a, he, he was one of the rare rare occasions where you meet somebody and gets, gets it, doesn't get it, will ask the question and then run let you run with it. He was a good guy to work with. I worked with him and his associate, uh, Eli, uh, worked at K Rock, which was the Howard Stern station, and uh, he could he could tell. We, there was plenty of stories, but the two of them together was a, they were a great team. But Richie passed away last week, and I just want to make sure I get that out there because there's a lot of folks that got the call and were like, "What? What are you talking about? What's going on here?" And so I just want to put that out there for him. So you know, condolences to the family and everybody, and all those of all of us who know him. And I know a lot of folks have uh, been making phone calls, so I just want to put that on, put that out. It- Indeed, and I got to meet Richie, uh, I believe, a couple times. But uh, a lot of folks who may not have met Richie would would be familiar with some of his work if you've ever seen pictures of what the Howard Stern studio was. The, that the one at yes. Sirius. 
Howard Stern Studio at K Rock at, at, at CBS oh, Studio. K Rock. At K Rock. And he was Those terrestrial okay. radio. Let me differentiate it. Yeah, he was there yes. in the, back in the, the early days, the late days. David Lee Roth Studio. I'll throw that out there. And Eli, when mm. he hears that, he's gonna be like, "Oh, here we go again." But uh, yeah, it was, it was. It was. He put up with a lot of stuff. And matter of fact, those of you who are Howard Stern fans would remember him talking about certain engineers, and uh, that was the, that was the gentleman he was talking about. But he 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 uh, <laughs> he was great. Did a lot of good work. Always made sure if he's going to put something online, whether it was a generator, ISDN, T1, or studio build, he would look at all the corners and say, okay, we got this right. Is this going to work? What if? He always asks a question. What if? What if this? And just to make sure, because he knew making sure that the host, in his case, Howard, got what he needed and made sure it was done right because he didn't want that phone call. He wanted to make sure that Howard was happy because if Howard was happy, the CEO of the company was happy. That's that's how yeah. it worked. And he understood yeah. that. So uh, that's why my tip was earlier. Learn more about what's going on around you and don't stick. Don't stay in your box. Hey, you he, have he a phrase. Afraid he was gonna, yeah. He was afraid I'm sorry. He was going to mention on the air. It's a phrase going to get mentioned on the air. Uh, and, and Chris, that's gr great advice. You've given it before. And I'll just mention again, the way you phrase that he always made sure the talent got what they needed. And it, it that might be what they want, but it certainly is what they need. Kind of like yes, Rolling trust Stones me, song. I worked with yeah. some big talents, and my my approach has always been, and the folks that I worked with, the people I reported to, couldn't understand it. I said, "Look, here's how it works. I might be the guy wiring up the phone into hybrid or the microphone or the console, but he's got or her their name is on the marquee. And guess what? When that mm -hmm. microphone doesn't turn on and that phone call doesn't go to air, they're not calling me. They're calling the host and going, "What's going on yeah. with you? Can't you answer a phone?" I don't want to be the person giving them that opportunity. And that's how I treat yeah, it. And that's how exactly. everybody should treat these things. Yeah. It's been a uh, fun show. We've learned, learned a lot. And uh, Bill, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Did, did you have any last things you wanted to say, Bill? Um, you know, just, just, just a couple of quick things on, on that, on that same line, need, need and want. I remember when I was doing capital for clear channel, I had somebody came in, came in and wanted a wood floor in their, their new office in the building. And, with a basketball cord. And I kind of looked at it and said, you know, you may be the sports director, regional sports director, but the answer is not no. He says, yeah, I know. It's hell no. Um, so, <laughs> so you don't need a wood floor. Uh, nobody else is getting a wood floor. You're not getting a wood floor. Um, you know, the other, the other, the other mention, um, and, you know, we, we all, we all know, know and loved Ron Rackley. Um, Ron actually, there's a piece of advice that Ron, Ron gave me when, when I was looking at leaving Jules Cohen and starting the company with Carl and Carrie. And um, it stuck with me, and I've probably told this to a thousand people in, in the, the almost 30 years since then. Um, Ron said to me, you know, he says, I, I can't tell you what to do. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but here's how I looked at it. To, to, to go off and leave the security of a job and, and start your own company with, with a couple of partners, um, he says, I looked at it and said, what's the worst that happens? I'm kind of sure my show. He says, the worst that happens is you got to go find a job. So, you know, for people who have ideas and, and want to do a startup, um, you know, that's probably the a piece of advice that stuck with me for years and years and years. And, and it came from somebody who was dearly loved in the industry. Um, just kind of something to leave as a last thought. That's a good thought too. What's the worst that could happen? You may have to go find a job. Excellent advice. Yep, exactly. All right. We got to, we, we do have to wrap it up. Uh, Bill Sufa, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Chris Tobin, thank you for being here as well. Thanks so much. And uh, Suncast, thank thanks for, for, for producing our show today. And uh, Suncast, within a day or two, as soon as I get him uh, the, what he needs, uh, we'll have the edited version. So we'll, ha we'll, we'll, we'll miss the, uh, uh, the little bit of silence we had there halfway through the show. We'll, we'll get that up on YouTube where you can always find all of our past episodes on the GFQ Network. So that'd be just great. Uh, thanks to everyone. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.